Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are to everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me, <laughs> lost my voice there for a second. Uh, welcome to the Student Scholarship Panel. I hope you are all enjoying the convention so far, and I'm glad you could come back and join us for this panel. Um, have a couple of housekeeping things I need to talk about really fast, and then I will introduce the panelists and we will get right into their presentations. Um, first, the presentations are pre recorded, but there will be about 15 minutes or so after the presentations for question and answer. So if you have any questions for any of the panelists, there's a Q&A button on your screen, uh, go ahead and um, click on that and you can type in your questions and then I will pose your questions uh, to the panelists. Um, also, if you have any technical difficulties during uh, this session and need some assistance, you can also use the Q&A button um, or you can email at e email to events at aldf.org and somebody will come on and help you uh, resolve those technical questions that you have. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce our three panelists and they'll give a wave uh, so you, you know who they are. First, Bianca Atlas. Um, Bianca is a lawyer from New Zealand who will be graduating this year with an LLM in animal law from Lewis and Clark Law School. She received her BA in psychology and linguistics and an LLB with honors from the University of Auckland. And she has her master of science in childhood studies from the University of Edinburgh. At Lewis and Clark, she was the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights Law and Policy International Scholar. And she was also the LLM representative for to the Animal Legal Defense Fund student chapter. Uh, prior to joining the LLM program, Bianca had a varied career working primarily with refugees and asylum seekers in New Zealand and abroad. She's a passionate advocate for social justice for all beings and is committed to using the law strategically and creatively to improve the legal status and treatment of animals. And Bianca is joining us this morning from New Zealand, where I believe it is actually tomorrow. So welcome, Bianca. Danielle Palermo. Uh, Danielle is a JD Master of Environmental Law and Policy 2021 candidate at Vermont Law School. She holds a BA in biology with a focus in ecology from Arcadia University. Currently, Danielle is a co-chair of the Vermont Law School Student Animal Legal Defense Fund student chapter. I think I had extra students in there. Um, her primary interest in, is developing legal theories to expand legal protections for amphibious, aquatic, and cold-blooded animals in the wild and in captivity. And our third panelist is Kayla Sculthorpe. Kayla is a Florida native and recent law graduate. She's passionate about animals, people, and the planet, holding the belief that in order to care for one, we must care for all. Born near the Florida Everglades, Kayla always knew she wanted to make a difference by protecting wildlife. During law school, she served on the executive board for the Animal Legal Defense Fund student chapter and the Environmental Law Society. Kayla received her JD this year from Florida A&M University and currently lives in Orlando, Florida with her three-year-old Dalmatian chief and 17-year-old tortoise dribble. And with that, we will start their presentations. Yeah, kia ora. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the organisers of the 2020 Animal Legal Defence Fund Student Convention for giving me this opportunity to be part of such a wonderful event. I'm really honoured to be speaking at the convention and to be able to continue my engagement with ALDF and the Centre for Animal Law Studies. So I'll be talking today about aquaculture. Now, when we think of farmed animals, fish are not usually the first to come to mind. However, today most animals killed for food globally are in fact fish. So aquaculture is described as the aquatic equivalent of agriculture or farming on land. Um, it produces a variety of fish, mollusks, crustaceans, algae and other aquatic organisms in a range of aquatic environments and can also occur on land, for example, in tanks. Now, as with intensive farming of terrestrial animals, aquaculture presents many animal welfare issues. But fish are marginalised, marginalised from our moral consideration and also from legal protection. My presentation provides an overview of the aquaculture industry globally and in New Zealand, 
identifies welfare issues arising from aquaculture, explores the reasons why the welfare of fish should matter to us, and then analyzes some of the legal protections for farmed fish in New Zealand and offers some rec recommendations to improve those protections. So I just want to start with a very brief overview of the aquaculture industry. So aquaculture is the fastest growing sector of food production worldwide. And as this graph shows, wild caught or capture fisheries, which you can see in orange, have largely plateaued. And this is primarily as a result of the depletion of wild fish populations. And at the same time, aquaculture has continuously expanded to meet the growing demand for fish for human use. A really striking aspect of the available global aquaculture statistics is that they refer to the total weight of animals rather than the actual number of individual beings. So for example, the 2016 uh, global data estimates that the global aquaculture production by weight was around 110.2 million tonnes. It's estimated that this represents between 51 and 167 billion farmed fish. That's around 167 billion individual sentient aquatic beings slaughtered for food every year. So in comparison, there's a, a combined total of around 70 billion terrestrial animals, and that includes cows, chickens, goats, pigs and sheep. So just turning to aquaculture in New Zealand, um, it has a long history, having been undertaken by indigenous Māori for centuries. Um, the modern commercial scale industry is only around 60 years old. And while many species have been trialled, the current industry is dominated by just three species. And these are green lip mussels, Pacific oysters, and king or Chinook salmon. So just very briefly touching on each of these. So um, green lip mussels are indigenous. The current farming system started in the early 1970s. And in recent years, hatcheries have been used increasing, increasingly for selective breeding of mussels, and this is for specific qualities such as faster growth and higher meat yield. Mussels are filter feeders, so that, that means they obtain their food from the sea by pumping water through their gills, so they don't actually need to be fed. Pacific oysters. Um, historically, the majority of farmed oysters were sourced from wild spat, just as with the mussels, but due to disease outbreaks, oysters are increasingly farmed from hatchery spat. And like mussels, they're also filter feeders, so don't need to be fed. Now king or Chinook salmon. This is the only salmon species farmed in New Zealand. It's distinctive in international markets because most salmon producers around the world farm Atlantic salmon. So king salmon makes up less than 1% of the global farmed salmon population, and New Zealand produces around 75% of the world's king salmon. These salmon in New Zealand were introduced from Northern California in the early 1900s, initially for game fishing, and salmon farming didn't actually start in New Zealand until the 1980s. These fish are anadromous, so that means they're adapted to live in both marine and freshwater environments and have a really fascinating life cycle, whereby they're born in freshwater, mature at sea, and then return to the very streams where they were born to spawn. Now, unlike mussels and oysters, um, salmon are carnivorous and have to be fed, and they're fed a manufactured diet of food pellets. So historically, much of the protein in their feed was actually sourced from wild-caught fisheries. But in recent years, people have been opting for land-based proteins to reduce the reliance on an already over-exploited marine resource. Um, in New Zealand, we have both ocean and also the world's only freshwater salmon farming. So in both cases, the salmon are basically kept in um, sea pens or cages. Um, in terms of the biosecurity, because New Zealand doesn't have any native salmon species, this has meant that um, our salmon that are farmed have been raised without the need for any antibiotics or vaccines. However, there is always the risk going forward that new pathogens will be introduced and that we may end up needing to um, use vaccines or antibiotics. Other species have been commercially farmed in New Zealand um, and there's a long-standing interest in the potential of farming more indigenous species such as the yellowtail kingfish and hapuku. So with that come greater biosecurity risks, especially if there's escapes from farms, and this can really um, impact on wild populations of fish. 
And global warming also elevates biosecurity bio risks. More pests, more diseases can survive in warmer waters. So reflecting global trends, aquaculture is New Zealand's fastest growing food production sector. So the table shows that while mussels represent the vast majority of species produced and exported, salmon is a so-called high value export. And there's also a significant Māori presence in the industry following an aquaculture settlement um, through the Treaty of Waitangi. So New Zealand has positioned itself at the high end of the market. It exports so-called premium seafood to 79 countries. And the largest seafood export markets are the US, China, Australia, and Europe. Given that New Zealand has a very long coastline jurisdiction over a very large marine area, and an exclusive economic zone 15 times larger than the land area, there's significant potential for continued growth of this industry in New Zealand. So turning now to briefly look at the um, aquaculture legislative framework. So New Zealand has a very long history of regulatory changes affecting aquaculture. We've had about eight different legislative regimes since the late 1960s. There's different legislation, different governing bodies for marine aquaculture, for land-based aquaculture, and basically in brief, there are numerous pieces of legislation, numerous regulatory bodies, and this means that it's quite difficult to understand the complex framework in which aquaculture operates. Something that's really important to note though is that the aquaculture regulatory framework is firmly focused on environmental concerns. So this is sustainable use of natural resources, biosecurity, protecting aquatic environments. So there's no explicit reference in the framework to animal welfare. Some provisions may provide indirect welfare benefits, but any protection afforded to farmed aquatic animals through these mechanisms is, is really incidental to the primary environmental and biosecurity concerns. And where they do exist, aquaculture industry codes and guidelines are reliant on self-regulation and are largely unenforceable. So now I'd just like to go through um, just some of the aquaculture conditions and practices that affect the welfare of fish. So in contrast to terrestrial farm an farmed animals, farmed fish have received comparatively little attention. They're referred to as the forgotten farm animal by some. And with the exponential growth of aquaculture globally, the importance of good welfare for farmed fish is slowly gaining prominence. The first challenge though, in the quest to ensuring good welfare, is that there is no clear consensus on how exactly welfare should be defined or assessed. So there's broadly three approaches. The function-based approach, which according to which an, animal, an animal's welfare may be considered to be good if their biological systems are functioning, they're in good health, and they can adapt to their environment. The nature-based approach is where an animal is deemed to have good welfare if they can live a natural life, expressing the types of behaviour they would in the wild. And thirdly, the feelings-based approach is where the animal is free of negative experiences such as pain, hunger, fear, and has positive experiences such as pleasure and social companionship. There's considerable overlap between these approaches and there's increasing acceptance that not only avoidance of negative states, but also positive experiences are important for animals. And this has implications for the development of minimum legislative and regulatory welfare standards. So I, I'm talking about this because how welfare is defined and understood is important because it will determine how it is measured and what indicators should be used. So for example, assessment of welfare based on biological functioning might just look at whether fish are in experiencing good growth rates or measuring their physiological status, whereas a feelings-based approach would require methods for assessing pain and discomfort, and a nature-based approach would look at the extent to which farmed fish can exhibit behaviours similar to those in the wild. So before I just go briefly through some of the practices and conditions that um, you find on a fish farm, I suggest we need to take a step back and consider the more fundamental question, which is, can the needs of a migratory species such as salmon ever be met in a captive environment? So I've got a list here of some of the key, I guess, welfare concerns um, or considerations arising from the farming of fish. So I'll just very briefly touch on these. Um, so water and environmental conditions, obviously fish are in constant close contact with, with their surrounding environment and water quality, including oxygen content, temperature, 
pH salinity is really vital to fulfilling their physiological and biological um, physiology. Sorry. Uh, so firstly, water and environmental conditions. So fish are obviously in constant close contact with their surrounding environment. And so water quality, which includes factors such as oxygen content, temperature, pH and salinity is vital to fulfilling their physiological and behavioral needs. Water circulation and exchange rates are also important and other environmental factors such as noise and vibrations can negatively affect some fish species. Stocking density, and something important here to be aware of is that um, high stocking densities are, are beneficial for some species, but in many other species, high stocking densities can be very detrimental. They can inhibit normal swimming behavior, increase aggressive and competitive behaviors, and increase the risk of injury, for example, abrasion from fish to fish or fish to cage contact. It's a complex issue and the mechanisms of stocking density are really only partly understood in relation to some species. So disease, as with terrestrial animals raised in intensive farming conditions, farmed fish frequently suffer from infectious and non-infectious diseases. And this often results from increased stress and poor environmental conditions. Sea lice outbreaks are a particular problem on salmon farms and sometimes the damage from this is so severe that the fish's skull bones are, are exposed. Some novel methods have been developed for combating sea lice, but this then gives rise to a whole lot of other welfare issues. So for example, some farms have adopted the use of cleaner fish or rasa fish, um, but this is shown to also compromise the welfare needs of those fish and they often experience high mortality. And then other issues, um, cataracts causing blindness have been found in many farm salmon. And it's estimated that around half the global population of farmed fish uh, suffer from hearing loss. Handling practices are another issue. Um, many of these procedures are considered necessary to improve aspects of welfare and productivity, such as vaccinations and tagging fish to identify individual fish but these procedures can also compromise welfare in other areas. And it's been said that often some of the um, processes to prevent or treat disease are often more stressful and harmful to some fish than some of the diseases themselves. So feeding and nutrition. As I mentioned earlier, farmed fish such as salmon are fed manufactured pellets. So a diet that's not natural to a species or that's nutritionally imbalanced can cause nutritional deficiencies Overfeeding can also be an issue. The feeding schedule and methods are also important, and it would appear that feeding methods on fish farms commonly deprive fish of their natural feeding behavior, and this often results in chronic stress and stereotypic behavior, which is an indicator of poor welfare. Um, breeding and genetic selection. So similarly to the farming of terrestrial animals, aquaculture uses selective breeding techniques. This is to increase production with a focus on rapid growth, flesh quality, feed conversion rates, disease resistance and fertility. So while increasing resistance to disease improves welfare in some regards, breeding resistance for one disease may actually reduce resistance to others or it may cause other un unforeseen consequences such as uh, brain or jaw deformities. Escapes are an issue. Um, they present welfare issues for the escapee fish, um, because obviously captive fish are not adapted to life in the wild. And there's also an environmental impact on wild fish, um, including the spread of diseases that may not be present among wild populations. Transport. So live transport of farmed animals usually evokes an image of cows, sheep, pigs, and large transport trucks. However, fish are routinely subjected to live transport between different farming systems and at different stages of their lives. These are often stressful and may cause injury. Um, also, some of the conditions during transport, such as overcrowding and deteriorated water quality, can cause serious injury or death. So slaughter also is a significant issue, and all stages of the process of slaughter, including starvation leading up to slaughter, removal from the water, transport to the point of slaughter and the killing itself, all of these impact obviously on welfare in a very significant way. It's been established through research that many of the common slaughter techniques are inhumane and some of these include the use of carbon dioxide, asphyxiation in air or on ice and gill cutting without prior stunning. So just to say that also it's very complex to assess welfare in fish. Um, 
there's multiple factors such as these ones that I've just outlined and these factors affect different species and different individual fish in very different ways. Um, one obvious practical problem is how to deal with the sheer number of individuals handled. So as the Farm Animal Welfare Committee has observed, there's little consideration of welfare at the level of individual fish. Generally, when we're talking about practices in aquaculture to, to um, ensure good welfare, often it's talking about fish as a collective rather than looking at the individual um, level of how, how a fish lives. And other issues that cues that are um, generally employed to identify stress and fear are often not access accessible for fish. So things such as vocalizations, facial expressions, and body language that we might um, observe in other animals, we are less attuned to or can't observe in fish. So given popular misconceptions about fish, including that they're unintelligent and have a three second memory, perhaps it's not surprising that concern for their welfare lags behind other animals. There's a large gap between people's perception of fish intelligence and the scientific reality. And this is important because public perception often guides government policy. Humans also tend to use an anthropocentric deficit based approach in our evaluation of other species. So we focus on what the other lacks in comparison to us with little attention given to some of the really remarkable capacities that these animals might have. And because of the many biological and habitat differences, humans generally identify more closely with farmed mammals than they do with fish and therefore feel less empathy and are less likely to regard fish as worthy of moral consideration. That slaughtered fish are measured by weight, as I mentioned earlier, rather than counted as individuals, I think really most vividly reflects the status of fish in our society. And also the use of plant terms has been written about quite a lot. Um, so for example, a cage of salmon is sometimes referred to as a crop and the process of slaughter is called harvesting. Farmers refer to growing the fish, like growing wheat. In such terms, um, Donald Broom, um, the professor who's written a lot on about fish welfare, he said that this makes fish seem less like individual animals um, and encourages farm staff to view them as objects rather than sentient beings. So there's a growing body of scientific evidence that fish are sentient and much more intelligent than commonly thought. For example, it's been shown that fish have the necessary hardware or anatomy to experience pain. They have um, these physiological changes linked to stress in response to pain. And there's also evidence of long-term alterations in behavior in response to pain, as well as the effect of pain relief. Beyond the research on pain are studies that also provide insights into the many capabilities of fish. So some really fascinating studies have been done that show um, the ability for certain fish to problem solve, to cooperate with other fish or even with different species, and also even the possibility of self-consciousness. So this gives rise to a moral imperative to consider and address the welfare of fish. Um, there's other issues, there's other reasons why um, different stakeholders might also be concerned with fish welfare um, beyond just um, from the moral imperative. So for example, Good welfare is associated with good productivity. So that means it's good for producers and consumers. And also consumers are increasingly concerned about the treatment of farm animals and many are willing to pay a premium for more humanely produced food. There's also international reputation. So for New Zealand, our economy relies very heavily on animal agriculture exports and poor animal welfare can seriously undermine New Zealand's reputation. So I would argue that it therefore behoves the government and producers to ensure the highest possible standards of welfare for farmed fish. So just turning now to the New Zealand Animal Welfare Framework. Um, so we have the New Zealand Animal Welfare Strategy. This is a high level document. Um, it acknowledges that animals are sentient, but then it also goes on to say that animal, animal use is acceptable as long as it is humane. So for me, this underscores an inherent weakness of the whole welfare paradigm, because the starting point is that animals can be used by humans. Um, welfare assessments in this kind of paradigm will always involve a balancing of interests of animals against either owners or those who otherwise seek to benefit from their use. The Animal Welfare Act is the primary legislation gov governing animal welfare in New Zealand. So the positives are that the definition of animal includes fish, 
and the Act recognises that animals are sentient. It's still to be seen how this actually bears out in practice, but it's a good starting point that that's recognised in the legislation. So in the Act, there are duty of care provisions, um, and these basically establish a statutory obligation on owners and persons in charge of animals to ensure that the animal's physical health and behavioural needs are met. And these physical health and behavioural needs are defined in the Act and effectively mirror the five freedoms. So these provisions may provide the strongest avenue of protection because there's no need to provide evidence of suffering, which can be an evidentiary challenge to establish, especially with regards to fish. We also have um, ill treatment provisions. So there's three different sorts of ill treatment offences in the Act, which I won't go into detail about. However, just to say that while these provisions apply to all animals covered by the Act, given the complexities of actually assessing pain and suffering in fish, meeting the high standard of proof of beyond reasonable doubt for these offences is likely to be very challenging in practice. Um, first of all, the fish must be found to have suffered pain or distress, and this is ultimately a question of fact for a court to determine. It may require expert evidence. Even if it is found that the fish did suffer pain or distress, there's the next hurdle, which is that the distress or pain was unreasonable or necessary. So this is a very common carve out in animal welfare legislation worldwide, and it essentially calls for a balancing of the harms suffered by the animal against the benefits gained from their use in order to, de to determine if the conduct constitutes an offence. So given the variations in how the terms unreasonable or unnecessary can be interpreted and applied by the courts, and given the premise on which the term is based, that some suffering is reasonable or necessary, its effectiveness in safeguarding welfare is questionable. And there's all sorts of other challenges in establishing ill treatment offences. So even a prosecutor or defendant could potentially challenge sentience in relation to a particular species. And it's questionable whether ill treatment cases against individual fish suffering silently in an industrial aquaculture operation among hundreds of thousands of other fish would actually ever reach the courts. So we also have animal welfare regulations and um, codes of welfare. So animal welfare regulations basically impose enforceable requirements on owners and persons in charge of animals. And they're basically introduced to better enforce the primary legislation by setting out clear rules to protect animal welfare and by providing a wider range of options for low to medium level offending. So there's one regulation has been issued in relation to crustaceans, but none have been issued for fish. Um, a lot of regulations also in relation to other types of animals and different um, activities, such as for dogs, bobby calves, laying hens, but yeah, no, nothing specifically for aquatic animals other than crustaceans. Codes of welfare um, expand on the basic obligations in the Animal Welfare Act, and they're not in themselves legally enforceable. Um, and again, just with, as with regulations, we've had a lot of codes of welfare issued for different species and different types of animal use, but no code for aquaculture or for fish or indeed for any aquatic animal. So I'd suggest um, that New Zealand could look at the World Organization for Animal Health's Aquatic Animal Health Code, just as a starting point, a very broad template to develop a code of welfare for fish and aquaculture. And um, just to end with um, a set of recommendations, which I'll just have to race through. Um, firstly, developing a code of welfare for fish and aquaculture, developing animal welfare regulations. And I think the combination of these would help provide a suite of dedicated legal standards for fish and aquaculture. Um, I think investment and in research that focuses on good welfare practice with a view to continuously improving the conditions in which fish are raised is really important. There should be mandatory ongoing training on fish welfare for all stakeholders in the aquaculture industry. Um, stakeholders could be required to attend training and aquaculture workers would be required to demonstrate an agreed set of competencies. Um, I think it would be, oh. yeah, I think also introducing a requirement for aquaculture producers to meet minimum animal welfare standards would be a really positive move. Um, public education is really important, both to educate people, the public, consumers, policymakers about fish sentience, 
conditions and about the conditions of fish farming. And this could lead to campaigns to call on consumers, food service operators, supermarkets selling farmed fish to pressure the aquaculture industry to implement minimum welfare standards. Um, mandatory labeling of fish and fish products with animal welfare attributes. So I think this would be a really positive thing. It would enable consumers to make their purchasing decisions based on information relating to what sort of life did this fish live. Um, the installation of compulsory cameras in fish farms and slaughterhouses. So this has been advocated um, with regards to terrestrial farmed animals in slaughterhouses, um, live transport vehicles, and also on fisheries boats. And I think it would be a really positive development um, to have on fish farms. And finally, of course, to increase government resourcing to actually enforce the legislation. Um, so I think no matter how good the law is on paper, it's toothless if it's not enforced, and this is an ongoing problem in New Zealand. Um, and just a couple of closing thoughts. Um, where the question of fish sentience has not been conclusively resolved for some species, the precautionary principle dictates that we should give the benefit of the doubt to fish. Such an approach is appropriate in the context of aquaculture, where there is a potential for suffering on an immense scale, up to 167 billion individual beings being farmed and killed for food every year. And also just more recently occurred to me that um, given the spiritual and cultural significance of Chinook salmon to the indigenous peoples of Northern America and Canada, this raises the question of whether New Zealand should be farming these animals at all. In indigenous Maori worldview, there's a term, a concept called um, taonga, which means a treasured possession. And all native species in New Zealand that have a really um, long-standing um, spiritual and cultural relationship with Māori um, have a, a, a basically taonga. So I think this is a, an issue that's worthy of further exploration. So in conclusion, the abundance of scientific evidence indicates that fish are sentient and that there is the potential for suffering on an immense scale in aquaculture. It's therefore appropriate that we afford fish the same ethical consideration and legal protection as other vertebrates who are raised and slaughtered for food. And I hope that some of the recommendations that I've provided will go some way towards balancing the scales for fish. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Danielle Palermo. Um, my note is a riveting proposal using the Animal Health Protection Act to combat the global spread of frog killing chytrid fungus. Um, this presentation will discuss how the fungus works, the Animal Health Protection Act's history and purpose, how the USDA could weaponize the Animal Health Protection Act to protect frogs, potential problems with this proposal, and why even with the potential problems, the Animal Health Protection Act is the most effective statutory solution. So we'll start with background. Um, amphibians play an integral role in our planet's ecosystem. They act as both predator and prey throughout their life cycle. Amphibians have permeable skin, which makes them sensitive to environmental changes, pollutions, and toxic substances. So if their environment is polluted, they take that pollution in directly. This sensitivity makes amphibians a natural measure of a healthy ecosystem. So globally, amphibian populations are rapidly declining, even being noted as the most threatened taxa of wildlife. And a leading cause of this decline is the infectious pathogen, Batrococytrium dendrobatidis, but today we will call it BD. So what is BD and why is it so bad? Um, BD is a chytrid fungus. In its infectious stage, BD is a swimming zoospore. So this zoospore swims from the host species, a frog, um, and it infects tadpoles, mouth parts, and adult frog skin cells. This zoospore only swims about two centimeters before latching onto a host. So this infection likely spreads from direct frog to frog contact or via um, BD infected waters. 
So after the zoospore matures in a host healthy skin cells, the zoospores then become modal and they travel towards ion transport activity, which then leads to chytridiomycosis, which is basically just the disruption of an amphibian's ability to pass ions um, and water through their skin. And that's effectively how amphibians breathe in the water. So chytridiomycosis impacts an uh, amphibian's ability to breathe and then eventually can cause cardiac arrest and death in many amphibian species. The BD is not to be taken lightly. Experts have deemed the chytrid fungus as the most destructive pathogen ever described by science. And experts have conservatively linked chytridiomycosis to the declines of at least 501 amphibian species. So BD is so destructive because it has an extremely wide temperature tolerance, spanning from 39 degrees Fahrenheit to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And this um, wide tolerance allows it to be successful and infect hosts across six continents. This spread can also be largely contributed to international trade and its effective staying power in all of these different environments it's largely linked to climate change. Climate change has effectively made the separate continents a more palatable place for this infectious pathogen. So despite being highly infectious, BD is not lethal for all frog species. Instead, frogs that survive the infection become disease introducing vehicles when they are transported into new geographic locations. So imported disease carrying frogs and can infect both regional livestock and wild populations and effectively cause um, a global pathogenic pollution. So the disease can spread from captive bred populations to wild populations in a number of ways, including infected or host frogs accidentally escaping from or being intentionally least released from breeding operations or by improperly um, releasing contaminated frog holding water and releasing that into the natural environment. So under um, proper conditions, this fungal pathogen can live outside hosts for months at a time, making it extremely um, detrimental to the surrounding environment. Over 85,000 tons of amphibians were harvested through aquaculture in 2005 alone. Most frogs imported into the United States for human consumption are captive bred frogs. So the United States is both an importer and exporter of farm-raised frogs. Therefore, the United States should be concerned with BD for two main reasons. The economic impact from stock collapse of farm-raised frogs and the inherent risk to wild amphibian biodiversity. So where does the Animal Health Protection Act come in? The act's purpose is to protect the health of animals, human consumers, American agriculture, um, the economy, and the environment. The scope of the Animal Health Protection Act is specifically limited to livestock, particularly focusing on diseases and pests that could negatively impact livestock health. The act defines livestock as all farmed raised animals. A pest includes any fungus or pathogen that can directly or indirectly injure, cause damages to, or cause disease in livestock. And an article is any pest or disease or material or tangible object that could harbor a pest or disease. So the Animal Health Protection Act authorizes the USDA at the Secretary of Agriculture's discretion to limit imports, exports, and interstate movement impose importation quarantines, and order destruction of animals and articles that may be infected with a pest. So the USDA may do this if it deems a restriction necessary to prevent the transmission of disease to livestock. However, this also could be applied to help protect um, wild populations. So the Animal Health Protection Act defines the term move to include to release into the environment, meaning that the scope 
could extend to preventing diseases that devastate livestock from spreading into surrounding natural uh, ecosystems. So the USDA also has the duty to con continually conduct research and on dis animal diseases and pests that constitute a threat to livestock of the United States. So scientific research reveals that international trade of farm-raised amphibians significantly contributes to the catastrophic spread of BD. Even though um, frogs may not be livestock in the traditional sense, they are a piece of international agricultural trade. So farm-raised frogs fall within the definition of livestock because the definition includes all farm-raised animals. And since, um, BD is a chytrid fungus that can directly injure or cause damages to or cause disease in um, an animal. It also qualifies as a pest. Frog legs um, and the water that frogs or their parts are shipped in should be considered articles because they are tangible objects that can harbor BD. So including frogs, BD, frog parts, and their storage water within the Animal Health Protection Act's definition would allow the USDA to put limits on international frog trade. So regulating animal trade is not a new concept. Prior to the Animal Health Protection Act, Congress enacted two separate statutes um, that had the same goal of preventing disease spread and gave the agencies the discretion for determining how to prevent that the best. So this history continues on in the Animal Health Protection Act. The act's legislative history also reveals that Congress believed that the most effective way to prevent disease spread was to give the USDA the discretionary authority. So this authority was previously challenged in cases concerning bans or destruction of animal products limited to specifically mad cow disease and exotic Newcastle disease. However, the courts held that the USDA does not have to provide a wholesale solution in order to act within the agency's discretion. So the um, Animal Health Protection Act grants the agencies a broad discretionary authority and the courts have supported that authority, which that now um, agencies the agency can use to protect frogs if it's deemed um, fit to do so. There are two main differences between mad cow and exotic Newcastle disease compared to BD. BD does not directly impact the health of humans and cattle and poultry products are traditionally farm-raised products unlike frog parts. So the Animal Health Protection Act's purpose, however, is not only to protect human health. It is also to protect the health of livestock. The USDA has defined livestock in many different ways, depending on the statute. And <clears throat> under the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, livestock currently includes cows, horses, pigs, and other four-legged mammals but the Animal Health Protection Act is different from the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act for two important reasons. First, the Animal Health Protection Act's priority is maintaining livestock health through the prevention of pests or disease introduction. Second, the Animal Health Protection Act has a stated interest in protecting the natural environment. The Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, however, is a welfare-based statute and is not concerned with disease outbreaks that could cause detri detrimental impacts on the economy or the environment. So since these statutes are fundamentally and wholly different, their definitions of livestock could reasonably encompass very different animals. So why use the Animal Health Protection Act instead of other animal welfare statutes? The Animal Health Protection Act, in my opinion, provides the most effective response to immediately address disease spread compared to the Animal Welfare Act, the Endangered Species Act, and CITES. And this is because the Animal Health Protection Act 
the architecture of the act um, grants broad authority to the Secretary of Agriculture where the other three acts do not. So starting with the Animal Welfare Act. Frogs are cold-blooded animals and they are currently excluded from the Animal Welfare Act's definition of animal. So they lack protections under the act. The Animal Welfare Act has been amended eight separate times. However, each amendment followed a large public outcry over dogs and cats and their use in different industries. Ultimately, the public may never gain that opinion um, that cold-blooded animals, specifically frogs, need welfare protections. And even if they did, the public may not believe that animals produced specifically for human consumption also require welfare protections either. And there may not be time to change public opinion about this, considering the rate of extinction that animal um, amphibians are facing currently. The Endangered Species Act, while it does provide some great protections against human-induced harm on listed species. Listing a species is also a long process and it does not attack the problem of disease spread. So due to the fast acting nature of BD, we cannot afford again to wait for individual species to be listed under the ESA and gain protection. And even if we did wait species by species, this may not even prevent these species from contracting BD. It would merely prevent impacts on these species at large. CITES is another avenue that could provide protections for amphibians and frogs. However, the purpose of CITES is not to prevent disease spread, but it is to ensure that wild species are not being overutilized or overcaptured in a way that could threaten the species extinction. CITES is also narrowly focused on wild species, so captive bred amphibians could not benefit from CITES protection. And furthermore, CITES enforcement also poses an issue. Um, each party to the agreement adopts its own implementing legislation that enables a party to enforce this international treaty. So the um, Endangered Species Act is the United States' is implementing in enforcement legislation, and we've already discussed why the ESA is not necessarily the best statute to prevent BD spread. So for international trade, Parties may cooperate with um, one another to work with Interpol to prevent illegal trade. However, much of the spread of BD is not contributed to illegal trafficking of frogs. It is completely legal um, trade that is occurring that is leading to the spread. And even if CITES addressed legal trade, CITES being an international treaty is also not mandatory, so it would require countries to sign on and is that then not necessarily enforceable. The number of frogs in trade for human consumption may be minuscule compared to those in trade for research or pets. Having the USDA in its discretion redefine key definitions of the Animal Health Protection Act may seem like a roundabout way to prevent disease spread, but it is currently the most efficient and effective way to responding to the spread of this fungal pathogen. Congress could always pass more legislation specifically um, addressing the devastating um, declines that amphibian populations are facing, but Congress is slow and frogs have never been the most charismatic of megafauna for the public at large. So while the USDA could theoretically block one key vector of transmission of BD, and perhaps through the Animal Health Protection Act, prevent amphibian Armageddon. And it could do so wholly within its discretion. So this regulatory architecture created under the Animal Health Protection Act is 
far broader and grants a stronger authority than the Animal Welfare Act, the Endangered Species Act, and CITES. Therefore, the Animal Health Protection Act is currently the most efficient and effective way to combat the global spread of BD and potentially save frogs from extinction. That's it, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kayla Scalthorpe, and I am a recent law graduate from FAMU College of Law. I was born in Miami, Florida, near the famously beautiful Florida Everglades. As such, wildlife, especially endangered species, have always been a passion of mine. After getting an ornate wood turtle for my seventh birthday, I became increasingly interested in the exotic pet trade industry and how reptiles from all, the, all over the world how reptiles from all over the world could end up in my local PetSmart. Um, before I start the presentation, I want to begin by thanking the Animal Legal Defense Fund, which has presented me with countless opportunities during my time as a law student and now beyond. It is an honor to be able to speak at this convention, which has been a goal of mine since attending my first convention in 2017 in Chicago. If I already know you, hello again. And if we have not met, I hope to get to know you soon. All right, so today we will be delving into the often frustrating topic of invasive species. Specifically, we will be focusing on the Burmese python, which has decimated uh, wildlife in Florida. Our discussion will include how climate change has allowed non-native species to flourish and how this affects biodiversity and environmental justice. Further, we will address the exotic pet trade industry's responsibility in the over-exploitation of uh, wildlife globally. Then we will go and um, speak on invasive species laws and management, uh, both federal controls and state controls and how that affects the spread of invasive species. And then we will conclude with recommendations um, for how to address the problem, which will include capture and release and creating a tax on the pet trade industry, which we will get to. So I think first we should start by familiarizing ourselves with the Burmese python. They are known for their distinctly patterned skin, large size, and mild disposition. They are a very popular breed within the uh, exotic pet trade industry because they are so docile and obviously beautiful. Uh, their native home is Southeast Asia, so Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, uh, most importantly, they are one of the largest species of snake on earth, growing up to 23 feet and 200 pounds. To put that in perspective, that's about the girth of a telephone pole. So they are massive snakes. They're non-venomous, um, semi-aquatic, and they are carnivorous. Uh, they suffocate their prey, and then they stretch their jaws because of ligaments um, in their jaws, and they swallow the animal whole. The Burmese python is currently destroying the Florida Everglades uh, by competing with native wildlife for food. They have thought to have been released both intentionally by irresponsible pet owners and accidentally through a reptile breeding facility that was affected by Hurricane Andrew in 1992. As some of you may remember, Hurricane Andrew was a Category 5 hurricane um, that massively destroyed uh, South Florida in some ways, uh, they're still feeling the effects of that today. Uh, in addition to the destruction of homes uh, after Hurricane Andrew, a nearby reptile breeding facility was heavily structurally damaged, and that led to the release of hundreds of Burmese pythons into the Florida Everglades. With an abundance of prey in the Everglades, including many small mammals, birds, and other little critters that the Burmese pythons prefer to eat, the python population has had the opportunity to explode in Florida. This has become uh, the problem that it is today because they are incredibly difficult to track because of their semi-aquatic tendencies as well as their natural camouflage. So what are invasive species? 
An invasive species is any living organism, including plants, that is not native to the ecosystem that has been introduced in and is causing harm as a result. So other than the Burmese python, another example of an invasive species would be um, the lionfish, uh, which also uh, Florida faces similar problems with. According to the National Wildlife Federation, 42% of threatened or endangered native species are at risk because of invasive species. All right, so now for the topic that brings us all here today, um, climate change. Reptiles love tropical climates. As temperatures rise, non-native species ability to thrive um, in warmer weather rises as well. U.S. states such as Florida and Hawaii are most affected by invasive species due to the warmer climates of those states. Climate change contributes to the loss of biodiversity. We can expect mass extinction for habitat loss, pollution, and invasive species, which will accelerate as a result of climate change. Non-native species have had a negative impact on biodiversity. Biodiversity is defined as a variety of life in the world or in a particular habitat or ecosystem system. According to the IUCN Red List, there are more than 98,500 species listed, 27,000 of which are threatened with extinction. Due to over-exploitation from the pet trade industry, the Burmese python is considered threatened in its native habitat of Southeast Asia. Ironically, despite being unwanted in Florida, the Burmese python is now considered threatened in their native habitat of Southeast Asia, the exotic pet trade industry. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, um, some of which includes illegal wildlife trafficking that is usually under the guise or false captive bred label. Um, millions of exotic animals are forcibly taken from their natural habitats and sold around the world every year. The demand for exotic species continues to grow every year, primarily due to social media presence, um, as it's easily displayed on different social media sites and it can be, they can be easily sold um, online. Recently, I was on Instagram and I saw an account of someone's pet caiman um, that they are keeping in their house. So clearly the desire for exotic animals has not gone down. Uh, the illegal trade industry has devastated wildlife populations of animals leading to the endangerment of many of these species. Loss of biodiversity is an environmental justice issue as well. Where ecosystems are distressed, people will be affected. Environmental justice is defined as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people in the creation, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Native American and indigenous peoples own or have rights to approximately 20% of the earth's land despite only making up 5% of the world's population. Research shows that Native Americans are often left out of the political process when it comes to in, when it comes to invasive species management. In South Florida, the Miccosukee tribe of, um, of the Indians of Florida occupied the northern border of the Everglades National Park and Big Cypress Reservation. Um, they are one of the six seminal Indian reservations in Florida. Due to their close proximity, uh, this tribe will be faced with the burden of dealing with biodiversity loss and destruction in an area that they live in while not having much say in um, the process of addressing it. All right, in 2019, the largest recorded python to date was captured. The python was found in Big Cypress National Preserve, um, like I mentioned in the last slide. At 17 feet and 140 pounds, the female python was pregnant with 73 eggs. After she was captured, her and the eggs were both destroyed. As I was preparing for this presentation, um, I wanted to go ahead and look up and see if there have been any updates on whether bigger pythons have been caught um, and destroyed since. And the new 2020 update is 18 feet, eight inches long, according to the Flor Florida Wildlife Commission. So what are the laws that currently manage invasive species? Under federal law, we have the Lacey Act, which was enacted in 1900 to protect wildlife from illegal trafficking. And within the Lacey Act, we have an injurious species provision, which I will get to in the next slide. Um, as for state controls, we have the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, FWC, uh, which has an amnesty program as well as a Python removal um, program. The Lacey Act and the injurious species provision. 
Under the Lazy Act, it is unlawful to import, export, sell, acquire, or purchase fish, wildlife, or plants that are taken, possessed, transported, or sold in violation of U.S. or Indian law or in interstate or foreign commerce involving any fish, wildlife, or plants taken, possessed, or sold in violation of state or foreign law. Um, as the name would suggest, under the injurious species provision, it is illegal to import or ship listed living creatures and their eggs. The Burmese python was added in March of 2012. The problem here is that the Burmese pythons were listed as an injurious species in 2012, but they had already established um, their presence in Florida in 1992 during the time of Hurricane Andrew, which means that there was 20 years between them being a problem in Florida and being listed as a problem in Florida. The act does not authorize agencies to take any measures against injurious species already present in the United States. This allows for the spread of species once they have been introduced. Okay, so that brings us to um, state control. So now that we've discussed the federal aspect of invasive species management, we will move on to the um, Florida, uh, the Florida controls for managing invasive species. In Florida, the FWC allows for individuals to euthanize invasive species by any legal means. Um, this includes the use of firearms, captive bolts, and even decapitation. There is evidence that after decapitation, pythons remain alive and in pain for hours after the decapitation occurs. Florida statutes 379.211 and 379.372 list Burmese pythons as a priority as a priority invasive species and allows for individuals to euthanize them by any means like I just um, explained before. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission also has an exotic animal amnesty program, which allows um, individuals to surrender exotic pets without pe penalty. The problem with this amnesty program is that it is only one day out of every year. Um, and then in addition to that, the Python the FWC has a Python capture and removal program. This pickup program allows for the humane um, killing of Burmese pythons in exchange for prizes. Um, in order to be eligible for the prizes, all you need is a photo of the dead python, the date and location that the python was found, your t-shirt size, personal information, um, and then you can be eligible to participate in the pro uh, the program. There is no there are no training requirements um, for the program, uh, nor is any proof required that the euthanasia of the python was even done humanely. Um, further, invasive species uh, are often exempt from anti cruelty laws in the states um, in states anyway. All right. Um, again, while I was preparing for this presentation, I wanted to go through and see if there had been any um, updates in uh, the Burmese Python capture or removal program um, since I wrote this paper several years ago. And I found this Instagram page of somebody by the name or who goes by the name of Python Cowboy. And I'm going to go ahead and read to you the caption for the photo. You can see um, the photo right there is of a man holding a slightly bloodied Burmese python that had been recently killed. Um, the caption states, she was able to successfully get a bite on me. Only got me once, but that's all it took. I was punctured quite deep on my bicep and forearm, piercing an artery and hitting some nerves. I was lucky she didn't latch on and that I was able to pull out of it. After losing about a gallon of blood, I was able to tire her out and get her under control. I then used my snake bag I had on my waist to tourniquet my arm because I was getting worried about how much blood I was losing. Better safe than sorry. I then had to drag all 150 pounds of her alive, working to control my breathing so I didn't pass out from blood loss and extreme heat from that day. I would have been screwed. After getting her to my boat where my suppressed 22 inch pistol was, I was able to euthanize her before leaving. So as you can see, anything goes when it comes to capturing and removing these pythons from South Florida. 
I recommend that rather than letting anyone and everyone euthanize these pythons um, by means of their choosing, we first extend the amnesty program to be year round. Um, most importantly, I propose the uh, creation of a program for capture and release. Um, capture and removal is not an effective or ethical way to address biodiversity loss in the state. There needs to be a balance between protecting native species and managing non-native species in a ethical and humane way. My proposal is that the Burmese python should not be killed, but rather captured and released back into its native habitat because capture and release is a more ethical solution and capture and release promotes biodiversity. Specifically, I recommend that we create a capture and release program. A more ethical approach would be to capture the pythons, then release them back into their native habitat of Southeast Asia. This would improve biodiversity by filling the gap the exotic pet industry has created in their native environment. Um, as you can see in the photo up there, that is a picture of a um, large reptile trap. Uh, as, a as a method for capture, the USDA's National Wildlife Research Center has created and issued a patent for a large reptile trap that is designed to um, capture live reptiles. Biologist and trap inventor John Humphrey stated that though the trap is based on a standard live trap design, the large reptile trap is the first to require two trip pans to be depressed at the same time in order to close the trap door. The pans are spaced such that non-target animals are unlikely to trigger the trap. This trap was invented with the Burmese python in mind um, due to their uh, size and difficulty to capture. In addition, I propose that we tax the pet trade industry. In order to pay for this, a tax should be placed on the pet trade industry, similar to that of the Oil Pollution Act which created a tax fund that, would that was used to finance the cleanup of any oil spills in the event that the responsible party was unable or unwilling to pay for the damages caused. Um, once established, this tax would serve as a fund to manage the cost of relocation of the Burmese python. Aside from capturing and releasing these pythons back into their native environment, the Lacey Act also needs to be strengthened to include resolution for species that are not yet listed but have already um, shown the potential to become dangerous. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I hope it was interesting and I hope you learned something new today. Thank you. I, there, I'm going to invite all of the panelists to rejoin me. And we have some time now for some questions. Remember, if you have questions for any of the panelists, you can just click on that uh, Q&A button and, uh, and, um, and then be able to type in your question and I will pose it to the, um, pose it to the panelists. Let me move my panel over here. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'm going to start, I have a couple of questions for Bianca, so I'm going to start with those. Actually, it's one question and kind of a follow-up question. Uh, so the first question, Bianca, in your view, what would be the most impactful action the New Zealand government could take to improve animal welfare in aquaculture? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, okay, so I think the most impactful action which I would also apply to all intensive animal agriculture would be to phase out intensive farming um, and replace it with plant-based alternatives. I think short of that and just questionable whether that would be very realistic given the New Zealand government's reliance on animal agriculture. Um, I think short of that, at least looking to curb the further intensification of um, fish farming as um, has recently been announced in Denmark. Um, and I think another key recommendation if we're working within the current animal welfare system that we have would be to implement an independent um, crown entity that oversees animal welfare. So 
are equivalent for USDA as the Minister for Primary Industries. And in New Zealand, they have a dual conflict with past with both um, increasing primary export and also um, implementing the Animal Welfare Act and um, ensuring animal welfare. But there's often a conflict here, so I think a really important thing, because our laws are generally reasonably good on paper, but enforcement is a real problem, I think, having an independent agency that actually ensures animal welfare. Um, but yeah, as my recommendations reflect that, I think there's a whole combination of different elements that are needed. Um, yeah. So our follow-up our follow question then um, comes from spring. Uh, at the beginning of this month, the EPA okayed the first fin fish farm in federal waters in the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf has a number of issues, environmentally speaking, that can do and will affect farmed fish and other species in the area. Of course, there's differences in, in the law, and those differences notwithstanding, what is the most prominent recommendation you would give U.S. advocates fighting offshore fish farming from your research in New Zealand? That's a very good question. Thanks. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, in New Zealand, animal advocates are really themselves only at the beginning of this journey as well. Um, I think because like many countries, New Zealand is looking to expand the offshore fish farming. Um, so unfortunately, I think curbing this will be an uphill battle. I think one really critical first step though for animal advocates is to get people to actually care about fish. Um, so I think public education about fish and the impact of intensive farming on them and another important recommendation, um, I know you said one, but um, I think another one would be to bridge for animal advocates, to bridge animal welfare and environmental arguments. So I think there's probably, you know, perhaps more widespread awareness and acceptance about, um, you know, the impacts of climate change and the impacts of animal agriculture, at least on land. So I think looking at some of the environmental and ecological arguments um, against um, intensive aquatic farming, I think it would be really important for animal advocates to work together um, with environmental advocates. And I mentioned before the Danish government um, has recently announced that their existing offshore coastal farms, fish farms will not be expanded and no new offshore farms will be um, implemented. So that decision appears to have been made um, purely on environmental grounds. So looking at the preservation of wild fish stocks in the marine environment, which is uh, become overloaded with nitrogen. So I think, you know, that it might be worth looking at, at what exactly the background to um, some of the, or the arguments that they've made there, um, if that helps. Uh, yeah, that was great advice. Thank you. Um, Otis wants to talk too. <laughs> uh, and so Kayla, I actually also have a couple of questions for you. First of all, a question from Tiffany. What do you think poses the biggest challenge to a catch and release program for the Burmese Python? Great question, Tiffany. I think that the biggest um, challenge to the capture and release program is of course, capturing the pythons. They are very difficult to track and therefore very difficult to capture. Um, I don't think the release part will be as difficult because once they're captured, it's just about the logistics of transporting them. So I think that to answer your question, the most difficult part is going to be to actually capture, capture the pythons, um, considering that in the years that we've been trying to, we've been pretty unsuccessful. And so a follow up question to that is once the Python have been eradicated or no longer a problem, what measures uh, do you think or maybe combination of measures uh, would be the most effective to make sure they don't become a problem again. So specifically for the Burmese python, they were listed as an injurious species under the Lacey Act in 2012. So at this point, it is a legal to bring them back into the state. So hopefully that would help um, them not to re uh, become invasive. But of course, that doesn't help the challenge of other invasive species that have been um, introduced and have not yet been listed. Uh, there, I found my unmute. 
Um, oh, I think I might have another question for you again. I do indeed. Another question just came in um, for you, Kayla, from Spring. Uh, when you propose a tax on the pet trade industry, similar to the OPA 90 tax to finance the fund, this is with the understanding that consumers of oil also help pay that, including any time you uh, fill up your car at the pump. Would you? Would your proposal mean that anybody who goes to the pet store would help to pay into that fund? I would hope so. Um, I would hope that a tax that comes from the purchase of said animal would uh, go back directly into the fund. Great. Okay, let me see what else we have here. Um, oops. Okay. Danielle, a question for you. Um, your proposal seems to turn on definitions. Um, as you note, the definition of livestock in the Animal Health Protection Act has two components, uh, both farm raised and animal. The scope of many animal law statutes is determined by the definition of animal under that statute. Do you think the statute would be stronger if it contained a definition of animal or if it listed what animals or types of animals are considered livestock? So I think what makes the Animal Health Protection Act so special and unique is its broad authority without having a definition of animal or a definition of livestock. The lack of definition gives uh, the secretary very broad discretion to meet upcoming challenges in invasives or um, pests or any new introduction of a disease into the country. So with our ever-changing idea of what could be a farmed raised animal depending on the culture or the import or a new popularity of a food source, for, some, uh, for instance, I think the flexibility by not having a listed definition like the Animal Welfare Act allows the um, act to be very broad and flexible. So I don't believe that a definition would help strengthen the act. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. Um, okay, I actually have a couple of questions about kind of the process of, of writing your papers, which as we all know is, is not always, easy. So these questions are for all of you. Um, my first question, actually, I was interested when I when I read these papers and, and saw the lineup for this panel uh, that so often we think when we think of animals and animal law, we're thinking of big megafauna or we're thinking of companion animals. And it was really interesting to me that all of your uh, all of your topics dealt uh, with cold blooded animals um, that we often don't think of in our in our definitions. Um, so I am curious to ask you, where did you come up with your topics? Um, what what made you want to write about these particular these particular animals? And Bianca, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, I think for those very reasons is, is partly why I wanted to write about fish, because they are relatively neglected, um, even by animal welfare um, advocates. So I think, I, I mean, to start with, I had probably a list of three or four pages of potential topics. Um, and I actually went to talk to um, or emailed a couple of people in nonprofits um, in New Zealand and Australia, just to run the ideas past them and to, because I wanted my paper to have some practical impact, not just be a, a sort of academic exercise. So for me, it was really important that whatever I wrote was actually going to be needed um, and used by um, advocates. So I think based on recommendations from those people and also just starting to become really fascinated with fish and aquatic animals, like the more you read about them, the more you watch video, videos about them and listen to webinars, um, you just, yeah, you just learn that they're really enchanting, incredible animals. And yeah, it just made me want to learn more about them. Danielle, what about you? How did you come up with your topic? So actually in undergrad, my thesis was on the intersection of climate change, 
BD and frogs. Mm -hmm. And I worked on that with uh, my professor, Dr. Binkley. And I really wanted to transport that into a legal lens. And that's the entire reason why I came to law school is I wanted to be a zoologist, but I couldn't study all these animals while reading all of these great research projects that they were all dying. So I wanted to hopefully help find a mechanism that could prevent at least the small part of their extinction. And I then ended up working with um, a, my faculty advisor, um, Pamela Vesland, who suggested instead of looking at it through the Animal Welfare Act to look at it through the Animal Health Protection Act because of its, um, it's a newer act and it had such great potential. So it was a very exciting process and I hope to continue researching um, legally about frogs and amphibians. Okay, great. Kayla, what about you? So I actually wrote this paper as a part of an environmental justice seminar. Mm -hmm. um, I had received advice at the first animal law conference I attended um, as part of the student convention to try to fit animal law in to other courses um, because it is such a wide um, topic and field. Uh, so mm -hmm. when I started the environmental justice class, I knew I wanted to write about animals for my big paper. Um, so I bounced around a couple different ideas, but I wanted to do something that I felt like nobody had written on before. Um, and the more digging I did, the more I realized that nobody was really talking about the Burmese python problem in the Everglades from a legal standpoint, at least. And, um, having been born there, I felt like I was the perfect person to do it. So I'm really happy with my decision to write about this. <laughs> we are too. Um, so for all of you, again, what was the biggest challenge in writing your paper? And Kayla, we'll start with you this time. Okay. Um, the biggest challenge in writing the paper was trying to learn about the Lacey Act. Mm. Um, because it was written so long ago in 1900, there's not very many resources. Um, I found myself looking through like weird, like almost like PDF screenshots of like old written text. Um, so I did have a lot of trouble like navigating through the Lazy Act and it was completely new to me. So that was my biggest challenge. Danielle, what was your biggest challenge? My biggest challenge was probably trying to move my lens from a scientific lens to the legal lens and seeing mm -hmm. We have this problem, it clearly needs a solution and why nothing was really fitting easily as a solution. Um, and then just going through all of these different potential solutions like the Animal Welfare Act, ESA, CITES, and what, like actually getting to compare them because they all seemed like great resources at the beginning. I'm like, oh, this Animal Health Protection Act may just be such a niche lens to be looking through this. But actually, after reading through all of that history, coming to the conclusion that I did pick a um, good act to look at, but <laughs> it was a lot to go through each of those individually. So, yeah, that is a lot. Uh, Bianca, what was your what challenges did you face? Um, I thought one of them. I thought it was really important for me to actually understand the research. Um, that had been done with fish and have some of that scientific understanding. So I think navigating that research was a challenge for me because I don't have the science background. Um, and another one was, so I made a strategic decision to write the paper from a welfareist perspective as opposed to an abolitionist perspective. And perhaps I could say that I'd be more personally inclined to the latter, um, but I made the strategic decision because I wanted the paper to have some impact and sway hopefully with the aquaculture industry, the Ministry for Primary Industries in New Zealand. And I thought that writing a paper from a welfare perspective would be you know, a little bit more tempered, but um, potentially something that they would take um, or look at more seriously and hopefully you know, developing a code of welfare for fish. So yeah, but that was a challenge for me just having writing from a perspective that I wouldn't necessarily personally um, argue. And kind of the opposite of that question, um, what was the most 
helpful resource that you found in writing your paper or even the most helpful person. Um, sometimes a person can be a resource. Bianca, you're still on, so we'll start with you. <laughs> um, a lot of people were very helpful. Yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate to be studying at um, Lewis and Clark at the Centre for Animal Law Studies. And yeah, I mean, all of my professors there were incredible. Um, Dr. Reddy, who um, oversees the LLM program, um, was really supportive. And Dr. Kathy Hessler as well um, was amazing. Um, and yeah, support from family as well. Um, I think just being, just really caring about the topic, I think that was a helpful thing. I think, yeah. you know, it's all really well to choose a topic that people advise you would be good. Um, you know, I don't know, from a career point of view or publication point of view to write on, but I think if you're, especially if you're writing a long research paper, you have to actually like what you're writing about and want to do the research. Um, so yeah, I probably that's probably the thing that helped the most. That was always the biggest piece of advice I gave to students when I was teaching is make sure that you're really interested in your topic because you're going to spend a lot of time with it. Danielle, what was your most helpful resource or person? Um, I would say my two most helpful people, again, were uh, my advising faculty member, uh, Pamela Vesland. She was so helpful in guiding me throughout the whole process, giving me edits and just really helping me focus my paper because I had so many different ideas. And then um, my undergraduate professor, Dr. Binkley, I really could not uh, even, probably would not have even been in law school if it wasn't for him. So it was just amazing to be able to rework with him and um, keep expanding on this idea. So yeah, I could, couldn't say more that it's very helpful to like your topic because <laughs> something that I've been working on now for three to four years mm -hmm. so I love frogs love the topic but if I didn't I think I would have found this to be um, not as fun of an experience but definitely still worthwhile but yeah, that was very helpful yeah Kayla <laughs> Um, so I think the best resource in writing my paper was my professor um, Eric Hall, and that is because he has more of a, he is a law professor and a lawyer, but he has more of a science background. Um, he actually has like a degree in marine biology. So he helped me a lot in narrowing the paper. Um, and he forced me to think about things other than law. Um, mm. So I was able to like look at the paper from a few different perspectives. And in addition to that, the librarians at the law library helped me a lot with blue booking because some of my paper, I was looking at laws from other countries. Um, I know for part of the paper, I had to cite a law from Hong Kong and I didn't even know where to begin with that. So I did receive a lot of help from the law library and blue, bit, and blue booking um, those citations. Great. Um, Okay, so we are coming to the end. I do have a comment rather than a question, um, a comment for all of you from Spring who says, thank you and congratulations to all of the panelists who all wrote amazing works and you should all be very proud of what you've been able to accomplish. And I would like to echo uh, those comments and say thank you as well for joining us today to discuss your papers. A, a lot of hard work went into those and I, I do appreciate what you were able to share with us. Um, there will be a recording of this panel, panel that is, will be available tomorrow. Um, to get to the recording, just go to the, sorry, agenda page and then the law student scholarship section and then there should be a button that you can use. Uh, I would also like to thank everybody who's here today. Um, if you didn't attend this, the first summit this morning, we hope that you can join us in 15 minutes or so at 1045 Pacific time for the second summit. Um, the summit features some resources and opportunities available to students and some advice on how to keep your chapters active while your campuses are virtual. And there's also some round, ta round table discussion on um, issues about that are relevant to students and student chapter related issues. So hopefully, uh, if you weren't there for the first one this morning, you can join us for that. Um, to get there, just go to um, the agenda page and click on summit and then you'll be able to join the live stream. Um, he's very talkative. <laughs> to all of you also, 
keep um, an eye on your inbox for a, your post event survey. We do appreciate your feedback and we will take uh, into consideration what you, um, what you say in planning our future events. Um, and finally, um, hopefully you will all be able to attend the Animal Law Conference next weekend. Um, that is looking to be a good conference. Um, and also hopefully you will be able to join us in person next year. Hopefully we will have an in-person convention in Baltimore currently scheduled for October 15th of 2021. So thank you again to all of the panelists and to all of you who joined us today.